This is a, a message that the Lord has given me on the victory of God, our Savior Jesus Christ, and His people. But we're going to be looking in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua, and we'll be looking at types and shadows. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, this word is yours, it is faithful and true. These are your people, and we are your people, God, that you have redeemed, and every life is real, Lord. It is not just written down as a story, but these are real events, real people, but they were written for us to learn from, and God, you have revealed what you will do in the future. You revealed who you are with your people. You reveal, God, your desire in your people and among your people and for your people. And God, we want to see what you have for us. What is there in this, in the lives of these people who lived, in the life of Joshua and in the life of Israel, Lord, that is for us, that we will gain understanding from. So Holy Spirit, come and give us understanding today. In Jesus' name, Amen. So what I what I saw in this as I was reading through this and looking at it was the type and shadow of the victory of God. We are not going to read this entire passage, which is Joshua chapter 10, verse 28, through Joshua chapter 11, verse 15. So Joshua chapter 10, starting at verse 28, through 11.15. Um, I will point out to you where and when I'm reading that you may follow, but I'm asking that for a true student of the Word, that you would please, at your own leisure, take the time to read all of the Scripture. Or if you want to pause this right now, pause this teaching, and then go and read it and have yourself prepared. Either way, because luckily with today's technology, you can just pause me, right? We all know that Joshua's name, it means salvation, right? And we know that Joshua is a type and a shadow of Jesus. This is a message of encouragement. A message of complete obedience. A message about the heart of the unsaved who refuses God's grace and they are so obstinate and blind and delusional in their thinking. <coughs> we know that at this time that Joshua is leading Israel into the promised land. That Moses is gone. He's not the one who will lead them, but it's Joshua. Joshua commissioned Moses, I mean, Moses commissioned, excuse me, <clears throat> Moses commissioned Joshua and Joshua accepted the commission to bring Israel home into their inheritance. And Jesus came to earth to bring the children of God home to our inheritance before the foundation of the world was ever laid. Jesus was already crucified. This was already done. He had already said, yes, I will do this because God knew beforehand what was needed. And I want you to also remember, because sometimes we forget or someone may be listening that doesn't understand this, but types and shadows, they always fall short of the truth. They're just pointing to it. They're not the actual. And the actual and the true is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I'm going to read to you uh, verse 28. On the day that Joshua took Makeda and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword, he utterly destroyed them, all the people who were in it. He let none remain. He also did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. So we see here as we're beginning in this scripture, I know we're jumping into midstream, and you can maybe, maybe you want to go back and read the whole book of Joshua. But we see complete obedience from Joshua 
as per instructed by Moses. Because remember, when they left Egypt, God had told Moses, I'm going to give you the land of the Jebusites. And he went on through the Canaanites and the Hittites. And so he told him and he said, you are to completely wipe them out. To wipe them out. And so Moses has gone on to be with the Lord. And Joshua is the one now leading them. And Moses has commissioned him. And he knows what Moses was told. Moses told him. And he knows what he's supposed to do. And so we see here that he wiped them out. He utterly destroyed them. As per instructed. And all those left in his charge are obedient to Joshua's instructions. He is instructing the people of God at that time. And they are following Joshua's orders. So here we see victory for the people of God. In obedience you see victory. When we are obedient to the Lord. And we are following those who are leading us. Who are obedient to the Lord. There is victory for us. And then we see in verse 29, he goes to, Lib- to Libna, and Joshua and all, in, all of Israel, they pass from Makeda to Libna. And then let's look at verse 30. And the Lord also delivered it and its king into the hand of Israel. He struck it and all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword. He let none remain in it, but did... To its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. So we see that here the Lord also delivered it and its king into the hand of Israel. Victory for the people of God in obedience and following God's instruction and being obedient to the Lord. I don't want you to think with the Western mind. I don't want you to think in your 21st century mind that we are not barbarians, that these are barbarians. That is not what it is. I do not want you to think that it is unjust, that it is unkind, that these people... Listen, they have already had 400 years to turn to the Lord. God gave them. But all they did was become more and more depraved. And God did not want to bring His people, His infant nation... Into to mix and to blend with these people and to be lost. That was not what God was about. And this is victory. This is a type and a shadow of what will be done at the end. Amen. So then they go on to Lachish. Joshua and all, all of Israel. Let's, let's read verse 32. And the Lord delivered Lachish. Into the hand of Israel who took it on the second day and struck it and all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword according to all that he had done to Libna. So we see and the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel. Victory, victory, victory for the people of God. When we listen to God there is victory. The enemy will try to deter you. He, you can't get into your thoughts when God has spoken something to you to follow him in obedience. Because the devil will always come to you and say, what well, did God really say? You just need to know what he said and then go and follow in obedience. Now let's read verse 33. Then Horam, king of Gezar, Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua struck him and his people until he left none remaining. What I want you to see here is that another king heard, heard about all of these conquests that were sweeping across the country, of these peculiar people who were coming across the country in a swarm, because it's not just a few hundred, this is millions, millions. And they're all traveling together in a band. It would be like a city being picked up and moving all as a unit. And so this news is traveling. It's going before them. It's going to the east, to the west. It is behind them. So all of the kings in these nations, they're hearing this. And they're hearing about these peculiar people who worship one God. An invisible God. They don't have statues. They don't have a multitude of statues. They don't have a king. They don't even have a king. 
It was being declared in every kingdom the news of the day. Lands were being lost. Riches were being lost. They were being plundered and the lives of all the citizens who have worshipped idols and rejected God's grace. They were being lost. King Horam <clears throat> comes to help the Kish and they are all wiped out. So uh, just remember as we go through this, we're talking about types and shadows that are pointing to the end when we know that our Jesus comes and defeats the enemy and there is victory for the people of God. A type and shadow is an Old Testament example of a New Testament fulfillment in the life of Jesus Christ and his work. Remember, it says the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. These events happened, these people lived, but it also says that the, but their lives are examples for us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. A type, a shadow, pattern, or person is a foretelling of future events. That we should be able to see the things in the New Testament. We should be able to see Jesus in these things. We should be able to see the king who sits upon the throne. We should be able to see our victory in him. We should be able to see what it means to follow him. All of these things. God is so excited about what he's going to do that he leaves behind all of these hints, these pictures and for us throughout the Old Testament, preparing us for the fullness of the truth. Jesus. In verse 34, we see that Joshua and all Israel then went to Eglon and utterly, utterly destroyed every person. In verse 36, he does the same to Hebron. In verse 38, continuing, Joshua and all Israel destroyed Debir. Now let's look at um, verses 40 through 42. I want to read this to you. So Joshua conquered all the land. The mountain country and the south and the lowland and the wilderness slopes and all their kings. He left nothing remaining but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. And Joshua conquered them from Kadesh or Nea, as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen even as far as Gibeon. All these kings in their land Joshua took at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. That is a word that you need to take to heart. You write it down, whatever you want to do. Israel, they're God's people and he fights for them. We, as Christians... Are God's people. All who put their hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's no other way to come to God except through him. We come to him. And we are his people. And he fights for us. He fights for us here. He has his people going out to battle. But he is with them to win the battle. And when we look at this in the future. In the book of Revelation. He is the one who is fighting. We are not fighting. He is fighting. He does it all. This is a picture of us. Joshua is com in complete obedience to the Lord. Jesus is following everything. He said, I do nothing of myself. He is only doing what the Father has told him to do. And he is given everything because he was obedient. And he sits on the throne and he is the one now who is in charge, who is giving orders, who is sitting on that throne and who will do battle. Joshua is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. The commander of the armies leading them into victory. The kings are types of Antichrist. The cities reveal their organized, consistent rebellion against God. I want you to understand that these, no one in these cities that were destroyed can ever stand and accuse God of being unjust. 
for he is not unjust. He has given them 400 years while Israel was in Egypt and when they were in captivity and when they were suffering under the hands of Pharaoh, they were free to do as they pleased. They had heard Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had been a witness to all of these ites in that land. They had been a witness. There had been a testimony. And they refused it. You have to understand they refused it and what did they do? They could not in their own strength become better, but they became more depraved and their sins were just heaping up. Heaping up and God had to answer that. As they had heard of the one true God from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, no man can say I never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. No man can ever ever accuse God. News traveled then as well as now. They heard about the people of God. Listen, we tend to think that this is some um time at some um time when people were just like animals. They did not understand. They could read, they could write, they understood, they were educated. They were educated. They didn't have rockets. But they could read and write, they could read the stars, they understood, they were intelligent. They knew how to build. They knew how to to they had architect architects. They understood design and they probably listen the things that they built were much better than what we build. They didn't have to have machines. They had people who understood plans and were able to do that. They were people of war. But their minds and their thoughts refused God. And so they fought against God. They heard all of this news, but they when these when the Israelites were coming across their mindset was kill them, destroy them. We cannot let them invade our land with their one true God. Listen, I want you to understand, and it's hard. I I do understand that it's hard. But when you live your life for Christ and the light of Christ shines through you, where you go in this dark world, there are going to be those and you don't understand it. They do not like you and they will do things to hurt you, to get you fired, to cause other people not to like you. They will spread rumors about you. They will murder your character. But it is because they are fighting against God. If they don't accept you, they don't accept the Lord. All these nations were destroyed with the edge of the sword, type and shadow of the word of God. Remember in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. Yes. Now in Revelation 19:15 it says now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And Jesus said in John 6 verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. Jesus also said in Matthew 10 verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So we're going to continue on in Joshua. I wanted to. I want to read Joshua one through um, five for you, uh, chapter eleven, one through five. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Ak- Ak- Akshaph. and to the kings who were from the north in the mountains in the plain south of Chinnereth in the lowland and in the heights of Dor on the west to the Canaanites in the east and in the west the Amorite the Hittite the Perizzite the Jebusite the in the mountains and the Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah so they went out they and all their armies with them as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude with very many horses and chariots and when all these kings had met together they came and camped together at the waters of uh Miron 
to fight against Israel. Woo! Jabon, king of Hazar. Jabon means discerning. He was discerning that he was going to lose his place as king if he allowed these Israelites to come and to bring the light, to bring the revelation of God to his people. And he did not want it. He did not want it. And he sent and he gathered all of these kings in the surrounding lands. And they and there were so many of them and they had so many warriors. It says, the Bible records it, that it was as the sand is on the seashore. He has certainly discerned that God is fighting for Israel. so And he will gather all the kings in the north. Amassing a foe so great that Joshua and Israel will not defeat it. Even if God is with them. He's poking his finger in the eye of God. He wants to touch the apple of God's eye, which is Israel. He thinks that he can just gather all of these people to do battle with God. How delusional is man? How delusional is man that he thinks that he can war against God? He thinks that he can gather enough people to war against God? This is in the book of Joshua. This is Satan inspired. Now, if you turn to the book of Revelation, we see that Satan, he is sending great delusions to man, causing him to think that man can defeat God and be God. He's done that since Genesis. He's doing that here. And in, uh, in the end, in Revelation, Satan gathers all the kings and the peoples of the earth to fight God. To fight God. He does this twice. And he's defeated. In, in Revelation 20 and 9, in the latter part of that verse, it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. God didn't even bring his army down. He just sent fire and devoured them. Let's read verses 4 and 5. But the Lord said, oh, I'm sorry, verses 4 and 5. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand is on the seashore, in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings came together, and they camped to fight against Israel, as the sand that is on the seashore, multitude, many horses, they are flexing their muscles. Why? To intimidate. That's how, listen, what do bullies do? First thing. First thing in warfare is to intimidate. To intimidate. I want us to... Read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 17 through 21. 17 through 21. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is the Lord Jesus and this is his people with him. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with Brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What does this tell you? Fear not, God is in control. And Satan does not win. He does not win, for he is an angel. And what can an angel do against God? And an angel can call all the men on the earth. As many as sand on the seashore. And what can Satan with man follow him do? They can do nothing. They can do nothing. God doesn't even have to raise up off the throne. He can continue to be seated on the throne. (coughs) Excuse me. 
Look at verses um, 6 through 11. I'm going to read verse 6 first. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. When the Lord speaks to his servant Joshua, the first thing that he does is he calms his fear. This tells us when when God says, do not be afraid, that when Joshua looked at that, that there must have been fear rising up in him. And the Lord, he calms his fears about what his eyes see. This multitude of armies, horses, and chariots that Joshua is seeing. I want you to remember that Israel is made up of former slaves. In this company, in the company that Joshua has, he has those, his men of war that are with him, but in the company are the wives, parents, children, elderly, cattle, everything they love and everything they own. It's not just warriors. Joshua knows this. And these warriors are coming out. They've left everyone safe and secure, they think. They've sacrificed to their gods. They've called on their demons And they are following the voice of Satan to amass themselves and to come against and to fight God. I I can just imagine Satan is saying, can these pitiful people that Egypt had held as slaves for all of these hundreds of years, what can they do? What have they practiced warfare? With you, you have so many They do not have the number of warriors that you have. They don't have horses and they don't have chariots. You will win this. Go. But Joshua has something else. He has the Lord God Almighty who fights for him. And the first thing that he does is he calms his fears and God seeks to calm our fears. That's what this is about. In the days that we are living in, folks, God wants to calm your fears. There is a multitude out there against the people of God. Yes. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They want to use everything at their fingertips. Social media. They want to use the laws. They want to pass laws. They want to intimidate you. They want to cancel you out. Um, They want to call you uh, names. They want to destroy your character. But remember... God says, you do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He wants to calm your fears. Second, he says, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. Listen, this battle does not belong to us. The battle belongs to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God will will bring a reckoning to all of those. And so we need to know that the battle belongs to the Lord. We need to be obedient to God. We don't go out and fight with swords. We don't have to have weapons. We have the weapon of prayer. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have the light of Christ within us. We have the word of God to stand on and not be moved. And we have the body of Christ And when we pray, when one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Third thing that we see is that Joshua and all the people of war, of war, attack them. So let's, let me read verse seven. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Miron and they attacked them and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon to the brook Misrephoth. 
and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. They attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told them. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazar and struck its king with the sword, for Hazar was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hazar with fire. So we see that Joshua and all the people of war attack them. Joshua is following the instructions of the Lord that was given to Moses and Moses gave to Joshua. See, <clears throat> we have the word of the Lord that's written down. And when we read it, we are not to twist it. Moses heard the word of the Lord. He was given the word of the Lord and he spoke it to Joshua. And Joshua didn't turn it. He didn't twist it. He didn't try to change it. See, that's what's wrong with the things that are happening today and the things that are in the church. You have those who claim they are Joshua's who have the word and they're twisting it and turning it. Read it for yourself. Fourth, the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. How did Israel win? They were delivered into the hand of Israel. And fifth, Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. They were struck with the hand with the sword. None was spared, and he hamstrung the horses and burned their chariots. Why? You would think, well, they could take these horses, and then they could do battle, and they would have these chariots. Because, listen, these men put their trust. These who were coming against the people of God, they put their trust and their ability to wage war with the strength and the speed of their horses. And the protection of their chariots. They saw themselves as being able to swiftly go in and do battle. They were riding on and being pulled by these strong horses to go into battle. And so they could quickly go in and slay a multitude at one time. But no, no, no. God's people are not to put their hope in a horse or a chariot. God says, no, 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 no. That is not needed and you will not have that among yourselves. Do not have that because I go and I do battle for you. And there is victory. There is victory for the children of God when God is doing battle for us. But not so for the people of God. We don't want that. God wins the battle for his children when we follow in obedience. Amen? Yes. Amen. <clears throat> Let's read down to 14. So all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua struck, took and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. But as far as the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazar, only which Joshua only which Joshua burned, and all the spoil of these cities and the livestock, the children of Israel took his booty for themselves. You have to understand that God was giving them the riches of their enemies. There were cities that they completely destroyed. Then there were just the enemy. There was just the, the people in those cities that they destroyed. There were times that they were instructed to take the riches, and there were times they were instructed to leave them. But here they were take, to take them. But they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. And as they left none breathing. This may seem cruel and unjust. As I said earlier to our 21st Western thinking. We live in a different society where we see. We think that this is so barbaric. And yet we think abortion is clean and um, let's see, we've sanitized it. But when we read this, we have a different view of barbarism. We think of this as barbaric, but we don't think of chopping a, a baby up inside of its mother's womb and then putting it on the side and reassembling it like a, jigs like a puzzle. Like a jigsaw puzzle you go and buy at the store to make sure that you have all the parts out. That is barbaric. That is barbaric. 
Every one of these kings were antichrist. That's what they were. And every citizen was an idol worshiper, demon worshiper. They were depraved in their thinking. They did not want God or his ways, and God's people are not to adopt the ways of unsaved man. Now, I could go off on this wild tangent speaking multitudes of truth and you can take this and and as you think on this and you think that is God does not want me to look like the world. We live in the world, but we are not to adopt their ways. What are their ways? They accept every godless thing. Every godless thing they laugh at God, they mock God, they mock his church. They mock the word of God in their behaviors, in their language, in their lifestyles. Everything they do in their art, in the politics, everything, everything. You can mention any false god in politics, in movies, in social media, but if you mention the Lord Jesus Christ, you are then heaped upon with just um hatred and animosity and calling you judgmental and you know all of the things I've heard so many so many tell me about their experiences with that and and it's no different then than it is now god does not want us to take on the ways of the world listen church How many churches have given in to that? Have given in to that and accepted the things that the laws of the land have legalized that are against God. And the church has accepted those things and said we agree with the laws of the land, we do not agree with God. And so people flock to those churches. Because they're comfortable there. and they do not want to be set apart like Israel was we are not to accept these things those things are ha- they have to radically be cut out of our lives radically be cut out of our lives just as the lord was doing here he did something in the natural that had to be done with his people so that it would be an example for us to do in our life to do in his church In verse 15, as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And you know what I wrote in my Bible when I finished reading that? It is finished. That's what Jesus said. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. and Jesus will mete out for Satan and his followers eternal punishment the day is coming we will be dressed in white for this battle and nothing nothing will touch us and stain our garments because we will be behind the Lord Jesus Christ victory there is victory for us there is victory for the people of God when we follow him in obedience I, I want you to meditate and think on what it means to be obedient to the Lord not to what you you think someone else may think I want you to think of who he is and as you read his word think on obedience to the Lord think on your victory in Christ Jesus because he has He is victory and he is our victory. He is victorious and you can only be victorious in him. Listen, we can't worry about what they'll do to our body here. We have to wor- our only thoughts of concern would be what would God do to us? It's to it is to be before him a yielded and surrendered life. It costs us nothing. we think it cost us so much but it truly cost us nothing to follow him because he comes he equips us he comes to live in us i that is 
just beyond comprehension for us. Most of the time we don't act like he is resident within us, but he is resident. And the victory is ours in him. Amen? Amen.